All right, join me now, my pal Jared Kushner, former senior advisor to President Trump and author of his new book, Breaking History, a White House memoir. There it is. I have my own little copy, too, on the full screen. Um, Jared, it is a great pleasure to have you on set, particularly. Thank Fabulous. You. Thank you, Larry. I'm used to being with you in the, in the offices, so yes. it's great to be with you. No, it's great. Um, and it's a good read. I've just started it, but I'm going to go through it when I get some time off. So I was talking to our mutual friend, Kevin Hassett. You know, one of the smartest people either of us know. I think that's fair. So Kevin reminded me that your book is number one on Amazon, at least the nonfiction part of Amazon. And here's the question he came up with. Who do you think is reading the book? Lots of people are reading the book. And when you wrote the thing, who are you aiming it at? So that was one of the things I didn't know who would actually be interested in this, because I wasn't really a communicator when we were in Washington. I was behind the scenes helping you work on trade and tax cuts and all the different policies we were doing to advance President Trump's agenda. But what I tried to do was write a book that really put readers what it was like to be inside the Trump administration. And you had two uh, conflicting uh, currents, right? On the one hand, you had the relentless pursuit of the investigations. I write what it was like to be accused of treason and colluding with Russia and right. how we worked through that. I write about, you know, the, the phony impeachments and the attacks from the media, but also how we got so many things done, how we had peace in the Middle East, how we uh, did got along with Russia, how we made trade deals with China, with the USMCA. So I really tried to take readers into that. And I think it's people who want to know the truth, who want to know what the media wasn't telling them for four years about what was actually happening inside the Trump White House. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important point. I mean, I think the achievements, the accomplishments themselves in four years are very important, despite mm -hmm. all of this, you know, incredible D.C. swamp backlash nonsense. It was complete. I mean, look, the president, Trump, took the worst of it, but we all got the backlash, too. Yeah. And you kind of soldiered on. Um, I just want to hit one economic thing. And I don't want to go to the Abraham Accords and some other things. But, you know, I have said that. So here they go again. This is like Russia, Russia, Russia. Now we're beating up on Mar-a-Lago and going after all these documents and so forth and so on. So, Jared, my take is, being not a lawyer, um, A, they want to keep him from running from president. B, maybe more importantly in the long run, they are reversing all of his successful economic growth policies. The tax cuts, the deregulation, the energy. They are deregulating everything. And we call it big government socialism. That was Newt's phrase originally. I think that's, that's it's a good phrase. It's a useful phrase. But look at the results. In 20 months, they've taken a boom and turned it into an inflationary bust. Now, the book will walk through that, I hope. Yes. Red? Very much so. And, and you know, it's, it's very hard to watch because you would think that they would be empirical and try to follow the best policies, right? The year before President Trump was elected, corporations spent six million hours complying with new regulations. Mm. For all four years, there was a net decrease in the cost of regulations, which benefited small businesses, which are the biggest employers. Uh, people were coming off the sidelines, entering the workforce. The workforce participations remained low. Uh, wages were rising. The wealth gap was shrinking and inflation was low. Energy independence, the energy prices were low. And so and most importantly, on the trade deals, we made a great free trade agreement with uh, with Mexico, Canada. We made a deal with China, which you were instrumental in. And we really got a lot of things done. And, you know, one of my favorite moments in the White House uh, was really on, on your first day, Larry, where we were having <laughs> breakfast together and. I think the market was down about 700 points. President Trump had put out a tweet at the time saying that he was going to be using tariffs to get a deal with China. And you're sitting with me saying, I don't understand this place. How do I get the, the people, the market is misunderstanding what Trump is saying. I have to explain it to them. How do I get on television? Kelly won't let me go on television. <laughs> I, I need to explain. Finally, about 30 minutes into our breakfast, I think Mercedes came down mm -hmm. and says, uh, the president's requested for you to go on television. <laughs> so you go on television, you start explaining what he meant by his tweet, what mm -hmm. he wanted to accomplish with his trade policy. Then you saw the market go 700 down, 600 down, 500 down. By the end of the day, the market was up 300 points, so it made a net swing of 1,000 points. And from that first day till the end, the president called you the trillion dollar man. I know, you for never moving let me the market a trillion this. dollars with one TV hit. As though I had any power over it, but yeah, he never let me forget that, but you're very kind. But really, I mean, it's like the Bidens, one of their biggest things here is to overturn all the successful economic policies. They just put their mid session review out, their mid year review, and the thing starts out by saying, when we were first elected to office, the economy was in the worst shape since the Great Depression. 
and this is after COVID, the economy was growing at 6% plus, less than 2% inflation, and the unemployment rate from COVID had already crashed down. And so they try to justify their, again, their big government policies. I mean, if you do nothing else, help me tell the economic story. Well, I mean, that, that's what I do really. in this book. I take people into also the debates because you had a lot of different camps in the White House. Trump liked having people with different perspectives. Mm -hmm how he utilized everyone's perspective and ultimately how he made decisions. I mean, we would go into meetings with President Xi of China and we weren't sure, you know, was he going to take Peter Advaro's advice? Was he going to take Robert Lighthizer's advice? Would he take your advice? Mm -hmm. And he kept us all guessing, but he also kept the Chinese guessing. And that's what kept them on their back, back foot the whole time, which is how he was able to make so many deals that pushed forward America's economy. Right. And everybody, as, as you note in the book, uh, most of Washington was not in favor of it. Mo much of Washington, official Washington, was against it. Mm -hmm. It was just the, you know, the inside bureaucracy. Now, you write in the book, uh, I think this is really your greatest achievement, the Abraham Accords. Um, you write that um, it was a true turning point in history to bring peace to the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. We almost got the Saudis into it. If there were a second term, I think they would have come into it. Now, Jared, uh, you were so instrumental in that. No one can take that away. Right now, the Bidens, pretty bad relations with Israel, maybe a little better after their most recent Middle East trip. But what they continue to do is try to make a nuclear deal with Iran, which is utterly poison to Israel and the Gulf states and the Saudis. And I do not understand what the logic is behind that. I'll be honest, as somebody who is newer to Washington, again, President Trump was an outsider, I was an outsider. In business, the best ideas have to rise and your policies have to be based on common sense. And a lot of what President Trump's policies were were based on common sense. And so in the Middle East, he tore up the Iran deal in two, that they did in 2004 because it was probably one of the worst transactions ever negotiated maybe in history. It basically gave them a glide path to a nuclear weapon. The mm -hmm. day it was signed, they were chanting death to America, death to Israel. Mm -hmm. They were using the $150 billion they got to fund terrorism and cause more instability in the region. Um, and over three and a half years, President Trump totally changed the Middle East. ISIS, which had a caliphate the size of Ohio, did. Iran went from 2.6 million barrels a day of oil down to 100,000. Their foreign, recur foreign reserves were basically depleted. Their economy was in a major recession. And these guys, uh, the Biden administration, basically ran over to Iran, got on its knees, and started begging them to deal. And the fir first year, they refused and called the Abraham basically Accords by its name. And so it's been a shame that their policy didn't just continue the Trump policy, but I think now and they're seeing more and more that a lot of the elements that President Trump put in place in the Middle East are actually working. The accords have been enduring. They've been holding up very well. He didn't, the relationship of Israel and the Arabs, even without the U.S. intervention, has been growing in a very good way. But I do think that not doing an Iran deal and instead try, trying to really strengthen the, the coalition between Israel and the Arabs that was started under President Trump would be the best way to build a really long, and enduring and lasting peace, which would be great for America and our interests in the region. Yeah, I mean, I think the coalition between these Iranian talks are like a poison pill for that whole story. Yeah. And I don't know why they want to continue. I mean, I don't get it. And I've asked a million people about it outside of the White House. So that was a great achievement of yours. That was a great achievement of the president and your whole team that was working on that. We've had Friedman on the set and so forth many times. So the other one was Trump rang the bell, the warning bell about China. Mm -hmm. That was our adversary. And Bob Lighthizer has been on this show many times. Um, Robert O'Brien also, it was one of his greatest achievements, warning people about China as an adversary. Now, we did a deal with them. It's been partially, partially implemented, but that was a great thing he did. I think that part of the world in Asia and the Abraham Accords in the Middle East are two phenomenal foreign policy achievements, Jared Kushner. Oh, phenomenal. But with China, in 2016, after President Trump was elected, President Xi went to Davos and he was celebrated by the media and the global community as the great champion of free trade really? and the great champion of environmentalism. Mm. Over three years, President Trump was able to get the world to see the facts that China was not playing by the rules. They were taking advantage of America and he imposed tariffs. And when he did his tariffs, again, a lot of people were very nervous about it. They told him that it was going to blow up the whole global economy. And I go through in the book how President Trump basically took a year to really listen to both sides, develop what were the right targeted ways to try to hit them and be prepared for the game plan for when they would hit back. And, you know, people told him if you put these tariffs on, the whole global economy will blow up and the world will end. Well, Which President Trump, well, he did it. And the next morning, the sun rose. The next evening, That's the right. sun set. And then he kept going on. And then China retaliated 
you know, hitting him in all these politically vulnerable areas. And instead of folding, Trump said, you hit me, I'm going to hit you harder. And mm -hmm. so what we witnessed was one of the biggest hands of poker in the history of the world. And I show how President Trump played it very strategically. He was measured and ultimately he achieved outcomes that nobody else thought would occur. Um, and really did things that benefited American business, protecting our intellectual property, protecting our crown jewel industries, and also in the end, really helping America's farmers who were badly hurt by, by poor uh, policies in previous administrations. And yeah, two really incredible, pivotal policies, China and the Middle East. Now, one other thing, an incredible policy. You were instrumental in Operation Warp Speed, getting the vaccination and using the private sector um, in six months or so. Uh, Biden comes into office and says the cupboard was bare, there were no vaccinations. I mean, he just lied continuously about this. Um, we don't have time forever, but just walk us through a little bit about Operation Warp Speed, because you kind of brought people in, and sure. all of a sudden, you know, and nobody believed it could happen, and then it happened, and I think it kind of saved the country. It's Well, the Lancet just had a study that Operation Warp Speed saved over 20 million lives because mm. of how fast it occurred. Uh, it was a culmination of all the learnings, both through the COVID response and through my years in government, where we've figured out how to get the bureaucracy fully out of the way. We utilized the areas in the military and in the government that operationally were able to be helpful. And we brought in the private sector and we figured out how to spread our bets out. I actually write in the book how I got a call from Ken Griffin, uh, the hedge fund man, who said, I said, if you have the ability as you start manufacturing while you're doing the phase three trials. And uh, we had a great group with Paul Mango, Azar. Uh, we bought in a brilliant man in Monsef Slawi, who really is a, a global hero for what he did. And we made good selections. The first one was 96% effective. And we'd ramped up production at the same time. And then we had a whole distribution plan. What, what they said was so disrespectful when they came in and so factually inaccurate. Mm. We had many meetings with them. We laid out a plan. Uh, we had a, a massive uh, uh, ramp up in distribution. We had contracts. We had a whole plan to do it. And a lot of the success of the vaccine, it was not about the Democrats, or the Republicans. It was an American success about American ingenuity, American innovation, American manufacturing, American science. And really, the military did an amazing job. And using the private sector, CVS, Walgreens, they all stepped up. Walmart, Doug McMillan was an amazing hero. I tell mm -hmm. a great story about him in this book. And, uh, and it was a great achievement that, that, again, if you would have had the bureaucrats in charge, never, ever never would have happened. Have. I mean, it just annoyed me. I don't want to obsess about it. But for months and months and months and months, Joe Biden said the vaccine shelves were bare and this and that. I mean, he, he and his wife were vaccinated <laughs> before they were inaugurated. I mean, it was just patent fraudulent lying. And you were right smack um, in the middle of that. This is quickly um, Fauci's role, you know, I mean, I was on that task force. I kind of lived with the guy, he and Deborah Burks. Fauci became a very controversial figure. On balance, was he plus or minus, you think, in that whole story? Well, in the beginning, we didn't really know any better, right? None of us had uh, experience in, in, in infectious diseases, and so we came with a lot of knowledge. But as we got into operational, uh, what we found is that he was in all the meetings, and then we would be talking about ramping up testing, for an example, right? And I always say when you're solving a problem, there's three factors that could hold you back, imagination, gravity, and money, right? There, we didn't have an imagination problem. We had a great plan. Uh, you know, we had unlimited funds to solve the problems. So that wasn't a problem. But it was just manufacturing. What I found in, in the manufacturing is the lowest cost item is usually your bottleneck. So it was the Q-tips, basically the swabs yeah, that we right. needed to manufacture. So we have a plan to do it. We're rolling out all over the place. We have an amazing plan. And he goes on television and says, we're just not there yet. Right. And people are saying, what is he, a sportscaster? Or is right. he part of the task force? You're in every right. meeting. You're in charge of infectious diseases. We don't have the supplies we have. You know, and there's a lot of mixed messaging that came out of it. So ultimately, he was part of the team. President Trump listened to him, but he also made his own decisions. There's one uh, scene I write about in the book where President Trump is saying at some point he wanted to keep the lockdowns going. But President Trump says, look, I am not going to oversee uh, the funeral of the greatest economy in the history of the world. And Fauci backs off and says, look, I'm just giving you medical advice. Your job is to take my medical advice and then figure out how to weigh it with, with how you manage your economy, you know, people's mental health. I'm just giving you advice on this one small He's, sector. Fauci, Fauci is a little bit of a tragic figure in this story. Um, 
I'm supposed to ask you if you're going to go back into the government if Trump wins. I know Hammer and Dana tried that this morning. I just want to know, that is one of the original ties that I gave you when I first came to town. So, so this is very one important. Of the, you, one of the you original gave ties. amazing advice on Washington, <laughs> on life, on how to get economic policy done. But you also criticized my ties and said that I needed to up my game. Something there. And most people just talk in Washington. Pick it up. But you actually came in and gave me three hand-me-downs. Yes. Uh, this was one of them. And so I'm very proud to have a Larry Cudlow. It's in very tie. good shape. I'm impressed with it. I might want to. I don't know. I might want to bid for it to get it back. <laughs> Any time, folks. Jared Kushner. The name of the book is Breaking History. It's number one on the Amazon nonfiction bestseller list, and it is a very important discussion of the achievements of the Trump administration. Thank you, Jared. Larry, thanks. Thank Terrific. you so much. Great Anytime. to be with you.